Good morning, everyone. Um, we, I would like to welcome you to the MESAC MuniTech Academy uh, session on ransomware. This is the first session that we have in a series of sessions uh, throughout this year covering cybersecurity topics. Um, and I just want to let you know, um, Bright Talk does track your attendance. So in your profile, it'll tell you how much time you've spent in here. So if you want this for continuing education credits, you can go in there for evidence that you attended this and how long you attended it. Uh, so if you get out early, it'll track that you got out early, just letting you know. So in the future, if you get audited for continuing education purposes, um, you can get evidence right there for it. I also like to let you know that if you have questions as we go through here, uh, there's not a way for you to voice your questions, but you can type them in uh, to questions here. Please type them as we go and I will try to answer them as we go through this process. Uh, this is being recorded and will be available for later review and watching. And also there will be a link uh, after the presentation's over. Um, I think it takes about an hour for it to get uh, set up, maybe two, um, before it's available for rewatching. But also the slides will be available at that time for downloading. Um, so uh, look for that as well if you have any colleagues that miss uh, part of the presentation or you want to go back and look at it or you want to download the slides. They'll all be right here in this location. Uh, without further ado, um, I can't have you guys all introduce yourselves, but um, I should obviously introduce myself. Uh, I'm Don Hester with Mays & Associates. Um, I'm an IT auditor and cybersecurity consultant. Uh, many of you probably know me, especially up here in Northern California, um, although I do do work down in Southern California as well. Uh, I do have a personal blog, which is LearnSecurity.org and a Twitter account uh, at SOBCA. Uh, you can check either of those out. Um, it's all cybersecurity related things, uh, blog posts related to everything from like what kind of cybersecurity documentation should I have, why is it important to have a CISO, those types of questions. Um, and if I get questions from clients, I like to answer them and put them in a blog post. Uh, that way in the future other people can uh, benefit from someone having asked that question. Uh, so today's uh, session, uh, we're going to focus in on ransomware. And I like to start off, because uh, I've done this presentation many, many times um, for different organizations. Um, I just was down in uh, Disneyland Resort for the CSMFO conference, where it's all the finance directors, um, and uh, talked to them extensively about this. I uh, just did a presentation last Friday uh, for the... Uh, Government Accounting Association, um, so our Association of Govern Government Accountants, sorry, uh, AGA, uh, did a presentation for them on this as well. So uh, there's a lot of interest in this outside of IT, which is a good thing. Uh, one of the presentations I'm doing is for the risk management pool. Um, so we'll be talking to risk managers for local governments to kind of help them understand how they should manage cyber risks, and that's going to be a benefit to you um, in local government if you're in the IT department because sometimes it's hard to get to the city manager to explain to them exactly what the risk is and um, why they need to take action, why you need the budget you need or why you need the staff you need. Uh, so uh, it, don't turn some type of tragedy. If this is a tragedy ransomware, turn it into an opportunity um, to at least get the word out uh, because everybody's asking about it now. This is a good time. Uh, especially during budget season to say, hey, we need to uh, expand some of our uh, controls that we need to have in place to prevent um, ransomware. So one of the questions I like to ask is, how likely do you think it is your organization, local government, whether you're a district or a, a city, what did, how likely do you think it is that you're a target? I like to start off with that before I go um, any further. Um, and you can answer if you want or, or just uh, pay attention as we go. But what has happened, now I've been doing cybersecurity, and I know some of you for 20 years, 20 plus years, um, before it was even called cybersecurity, uh, that a long time ago I talk about it, and especially when I was doing audits related to it, and it's like nobody would listen. I would say, hey, you need to have antivirus, you need to have firewalls, you need to have, you know, asking all the simple things that we all now do and take for granted, um, but one of the things that was a disconnect that we found um, in 20 years of research is that management has largely been uninvolved. Uh, for most local governments, 
what we find is they don't understand that there's a connection between IT and the business process or the mission of the city or the district. They don't see that that kind of goes together. There's that disconnect. And, um, but recently, because of ransomware attacks, that's kind of changed uh, because they've all figured out that, oh my gosh, if we get hit with ransomware, we may not be able to do any services. And I do presentations like this, just did it for a local government, and you know, somebody raised their hand and they say, hey, you know, I work in public works. Uh, it's not really a big thing. It's not gonna stop my uh, you know, ability to do my job. And I said, well, how about getting paid? <laughs> um, uh, do you need to purchase items in order for you to continue doing your job? Well, yes. Do you need to have email? Do you need to fill out your timesheet? So even if you're in public works, there is a requirement that you use computers and data, right? So there, we, we understand that now, hopefully. But what we have found, this just came out uh, two weeks ago um, from uh, the Cal CPA, and they basically have said, and this isn't any news to me, but organizations are starting to understand that cyber risk is their number one business risk. We should take advantage of that at this point in time, knowing that there is risk, that they understand it is now a prime opportunity for us to move forward in IT to get uh, you know, a seat at the table if necessary to make sure that the senior executives can make decisions based upon what we know the risk is. That means that all of us need to know a little bit about risk management, and we'll talk about that in one of those future seminars. Uh, but I want to make sure that we kind of understand kind of where we're at right now, that there is an awareness outside of IT now that business risk is related to cyber risk. Um, so one thing, I, as an auditor, uh, one of my biggest job role is probably auditor. But uh, so when I go in there and people say, hey, we're pretty, pretty well off for ransomware. We don't have to worry about getting hit. Now, the people that are online right now, you probably have somewhat of a concern or you're wanting to figure out what should I be doing. Um, you're the good ones. The ones that are not paying attention, who don't they think they're doing well enough, I can tell you as an auditor, I, I, I like to quote Darth Vader, I don't share your optimistic appraisal of the situation. And why is that? Well, I, we do a lot of ransomware risk assessments and one of the ways that we do to figure out what the risk should be is we have to figure out what your vulnerabilities are so we typically go in with a scanning device and do an internal scan. And what we find is very high risk. There are a number of vulnerabilities that are really high risk. Uh, I don't want to say that you're like Swiss cheese, but a lot of local governments are not uh, addressing the risk ma or vulnerability management internally. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but to deny that we have risk is also kind of like, you know, being like a uh, ostrich and sticking our head in the sand, we have to uh, understand that there is a risk and that we need to understand what our vulnerabilities are and that we can make decisions. And this is how we should start making decisions using risk management. Now, uh, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency and the federal government, the Department of Homeland Security has come out with guidance. NIST is coming out, just came out with guidance in draft form um, in, in order for what local government, state and local government should do in order to help uh, prevent ransomware, but not only prevent ransomware, but also how to limit the impact of ransomware. So it's not just about trying to prevent it, uh, it's about how do we minimize if we do get hit with ransomware, what do we need to do? Um, and what we have found through uh, research and, and what you've heard in the news is very much true. Ransomware is probably the most effective uh, cyber attack that's ever been launched. Um, it has hurt more businesses than any other type of rent, uh, any other type of malware up until this point. Um, and, and of course, people hacking in and doing things like the Equifax breach. Yes, those are big, impactful things. But it's not as systemic. It's like they hit Target and they hit Equifax. You know, it's not widespread like ransomware, where it's hitting everything. And I think to understand that, we kind of have to understand who the bad guys are and what motivates them so that we can understand why, as local governments, why are we targets um, and what we can do about it um, and what we should, you know, try to avoid if at all possible. Now, 
if you see this screen, it's probably not a good uh, indication. <laughs> um, and it's probably going to start your incident response process. And hopefully you have one documented and it's formalized and you've tested it, you know it works. Uh, if not, uh, that's probably one of your first things you want to get on. But uh, anyways, uh, just to give a brief uh, overview for this, um, when I do presentations for uh, executive management or city council or board, uh, I typically have to explain what ransomware is. So in case uh, anyone is um, wondering, you know, how can I present that to them, I typically tell them, hey, it's malicious software. We call it malware. We don't say viruses and worms anymore because the distinction is irrelevant. It's just malicious software, so we just call it malware. Um, there's two different types, one that encrypts the data on the system, one that locks the system out. And they typically ask for a ransom in order for you to unlock the system or decrypt the um, uh, decrypt the uh, uh, encrypted data. So this is a great way to explain it to them. I would not get into any explanations beyond that. Don't tell them about all the different types of ransomware out there or uh, executive management is not really interested in uh, those types of definitions. Um, there was a good question. Are, are there any federal or state grants to help small municipalities with mitigation of ransomware risk? Um, currently, I am not aware of any of them. Um, we do CISO as an outsourced service for some local governments, so we try to look for those types of things, but I have not seen any of those things. They have a lot of guidance, but not a lot of funds, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so, anyways, ransomware, defining it, make sure you do it. You can use the FBI's one, but usually it's a little bit more complicated than that. But if anyone is interested in, in those types of things, uh, usually I find if you're talking to a city manager or general manager, this type of definition doesn't work. Go back to the very simple, very basic 30,000 level I view. It's malicious software that locks your system out. And they demand a ransom for you to unlock it. Keep it simple uh, when talking to them. People think that this ransomware is new. It's not new, it's been around since 1989. And if you've been reading any articles online, a lot of people say, hey, this has been around for a long time. One of the things that's interesting about it is back then it was hard to disseminate in other words, you had to send somebody a floppy disk and hope that they put it in. A lot of people would get a floppy disk back then. They weren't computer savvy or computer security savvy. Um, so they may have just put it in, not thinking about it. Uh, but a lot of times in the past, um, people would get a strange disk in the mail and they just throw it away. Or they keep it and reformat it so they can use it for something else, right? So I don't know that um, having uh, uh, this, it wasn't very effective because not a lot of people got hit with it. Plus, in 1989, think about what computers were doing. It wasn't the main mode of operation for an organization. In other words, they could work without the computer. Uh, they liked using the computer because it was easier to use a spreadsheet. It was easier to write a document. But by 1989, people had, you know, most people in their career in 1989 had used typewriters and continued to use typewriters on a regular basis. So it wasn't that big. Also, getting the funds from people was difficult. They would have to have you do a wire, uh, you know, like go to Western Union and, and try and transmit uh, the money that way. Uh, but the authorities can kind of watch, uh, you know, where that money's getting picked up and stuff like that. So it wasn't very effective back then. So it kind of disappeared, reared its head every once in a while, but not very systemically. And, and one of the reasons is it was hard to get the money and it was hard to disseminate the virus or the malware. Uh, today, however, uh, because we rely so much on computers, because everything is connected, and because we have things like Bitcoin, it makes it really easy for money to be transferred. It makes it really easy uh, for them uh, to get the uh, malware onto your system. And it's much more likely you are to pay because you rely upon the system and you actually need it. So uh, yes, back in the day, ransomware wasn't that big of a deal, but now it is kind of moving uh, and obviously very much moving. Uh, typically, the ransoms are almost always in some type of form of cryptocurrency. I have not seen one where it was not. Um, most of the time it's Bitcoin, but there's other coinages out there, uh, other uh, cryptocurrency. Um, so you just have to kind of know which one uh, they're asking for. Uh, oftentimes they will ask for a modest amount. They're not going to try and break the bank. Um, they look at it this way. Who is more likely to pay for your data than you, right? Uh, they could break into your system, take all your uh, data, and then try and sell it on the dark web, but who's going to buy it, right? 
in most local governments, most of the information that is available is readily available. So it's not really like you're trying to hide anything. And most of it's benign information that's not nobody's going to pay for on the dark web. But if they lock you out of it, you're more likely to pay it. So that's what it is. So they, they ask for a modest amount because they want to make sure uh, that you pay. That Because they don't get anything if you don't pay, right? So they, they want to get a payment out of you, anything. Uh, they're kind of like bill collectors that way, right? Um, so a lot of organizations will pay to get their systems back because it's cheaper than trying to recover. Uh, and unfortunately, that encourages crime, right? Uh, FBI did come out with guidance saying, hey, don't pay it. They recently changed that guidance to you have to make the decision, do a risk assessment to determine whether or not you can recover. And if you can't recover and you need to pay, then we're not going to tell you not to. Because they understand that there's operational necessity and they can't prevent you from, you know, commun uh, continuing operations. Um, oftentimes the ransom is negotiable. They're not necessarily going to hold you to the fire and say, I want, you know, this much. You can always negotiate down. So I, uh, whoever's the best haggler on your staff, <laughs> um, have them go out and talk to them. Uh, but remember that if you do pay it, it encourages crime. So um, we have to take that into consideration. There's lots of different ransomware out there, and this is constantly changing. So um, I recently did this uh, back, uh, uh, two different webinars on ransomware. Uh, but so much has changed in the last three months that I've had to update a lot of stuff. Um, and so some of this information here about what's the most seen ones has completely changed. As soon as antivirus vendors or other uh, vendors that, you know, have other types of uh, products that look for ransomware, uh, figure out a signature or figure out, uh, you know, how the, the, the virus or malware spreads, um, they start to change what uh, they're using. So there's, they're doing constant development on their end to try and prove how well they'll lock you out. So there's a lot of this good information, but I don't know that it's really going to help you. Who gets hit the most is really interesting because U.S. is one of the top ones, but we're not the only one. Uh, and then how much the ransom amount has been asked uh, depending upon the type of ransomware depends upon typically who's behind it and who's behind it typically drives how much they're asking for. So if it's uh, smaller um, cyber criminals, uh, gangs or whatever, they typically ask for a little bit less. And if it's some of the larger ones or nation states, they typically ask for more. Um, why do they want you to pay in Bitcoin? Because it's really easy to launder the money. Uh, you can put the money into it. They have these things called Bitcoin uh, mixers that basically transfer the money all over the place. So you can't even figure out who has the money now. And then it uh, puts it into their accounts wherever they are, splits it up with their different uh, holdings or their different people that they need to pay. Because a lot of this is organized crime. So they may be actually paying multiple people who helped get into your system uh, and break into it. So uh, they're doing that. Um, there's a lot of costs, which I'll get back to in a minute, but um, just as a reference, there's a lot of costs related to um, ransomware, not just the ransom, right? So the ransom, if you don't pay the ransom, then what are your costs going to be? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll actually give you some good numbers. Uh, what we also see is that part of the cost is that uh, insurance rates are going up, <laughs> right? Um, so because insurance, or insurance uh, companies are finding out, oh, wow, we're paying out. We're paying out the maximum amount almost every time. Um, they're saying, well, then we need to collect more money. Uh, interesting thing on the insurance company side of things, if they're not making money, then they're not issuing insurance. So uh, they, they have to be able to have enough money to, in order to pay claims. So uh, in order to do that, and they got to play their staff and all this stuff, they have to make a profit, right? So um, those rates are going to go up. Now, typical organizations that are targeted, and I asked the question up front, how likely do you think it is local government? Uh, what we found is the top one is medical. And if I ask what you guys think, the reason for that is, I get a number of different answers, but the biggest thing is it's life safety. And so when a life safety issue happens, there's more likely to pay. Organizations are much more likely to pay if, uh, especially a hospital, if their defibrillators aren't working or their heart monitors aren't working, right? They're more likely to pay. Transportation, local government education. Now, you no, know, that should kind of raise a flag to you and say, wait, transportation, a lot of that is local government, <laughs> right? And education, that's local government, a lot of it, right? So actually, local government is like number two, if you really think about it. If you take out the private transportation, private education, I'm pretty sure local government gets popped up to uh, the next level. 
Uh, hotels, for some reason, get targeted, and even individuals. I just did a presentation on Friday, and I asked how many people had their personal device attacked, and like four or five people raised their hand. Many of them had their phones hit, um, and they didn't pay the ransom. What they ended up doing was just taking it back to Apple Care and having them reset the device. Um, so anyone's a potential target, but when uh, because anybody will pay for their data. I mean, individuals are getting hit with all kinds of different scams uh, as well, which we don't have time to get into here. But uh, there's a lot of things that you can kind of warn your employees, your city employees, district employees, uh, so that they're more careful with their self personally, and then they'll be more careful when they're in the office, right? So. Uh, we, helping them out be more safe, cyber safe, is going to help out with uh, your organization. Now, for some reason, it took the FBI until October of last year to say, hey, ransomware is a big, high-impact uh, thing for uh, U.S. businesses and organizations. Uh, when we knew that this was a big impact in 2017, 2018 it rose, and in 2019, I think January, February, or was it just January, I'm not sure um, if it was the first quarter or just January, um, had more ransomware attacks in that part of 2019 than in 2018 and 2017 combined, right? So that should have been a, a big indication that, hey, uh, this is a, something serious, at least the potential is serious. And the impact that we've seen from organizations, most organizations that have had 100 to 500 employees uh, have a difficult time, very difficult time recovering from ransomware, and some of them actually just file for bankruptcy. Uh, local governments can't do that or are not going to do that. So not that they can't file for bankruptcy, but they can't just close up shop and say, okay, we're done. Let's open up a new business. No, the city has operations have to continue on. So uh, that's not an option for you guys, nor would you want it to be an option. But a lot of organizations that are the same size as you are going out of business. That's how impactful it is um, to organizations. So that we should keep that in the back of our head. Also knowing that cities are being hit, that it's actually in the news that you guys are being hit, that should have been a first indication to somebody that, hey, we need to do something about this on the local government side of things. Um, and I think for the most part, we have, but uh, again, this is coming out, I think the date on this was August 20th, 2019. So it's taking a little bit of time um, after we in the industry, cybersecurity industry, back in 2017, were raising the alarm that we needed to be, uh, we needed to start working on preparing for this. Um, so, uh, I guess part of my concern is that it took two years before really anybody started to get into it. So, what are the stats for last year? Government agencies, 966 of them were hit last year. 113 of those were state and local municipalities. Um, and uh, of that, I. Not, I guess a part of that is 764 healthcare providers were actually hit. Um, and most of those are private or nonprofit, right? So, but there are some local counties that have hospital services that were also hit. So some of that's local government, some of it's private, some of it's nonprofit. So just so you're aware of that. An uh, interesting thing is that 89 universities, colleges, and school districts got hit. But when you think of a university, college, or school district, and if you're working for one of them, you know that you have multiple campuses. And so if a school district gets hit and you have 10 campuses and all 10 of those campuses get hit, it's like 10 different businesses getting hit. So how many of those total was it? It's 1,233. So you can see that there's been a, a huge hit and that schools are kind of being targeted a little bit more, which is a funny thing because schools typically have less money uh, than uh, like a city or a district. So uh, it's interesting that they were hit. Uh, I think one of the reasons why they hit and why they've always been hit is that cybersecurity in schools, even large schools, is still a little bit lacking. Um, and I'm saying that as an auditor, I'm talking about it objectively, it's a known problem. And that uh, part of the problem is that there is a, 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 a corporate culture of openness when you talk about uh, uh, with the teachers and the staff of a university um, in schools. And so one of the problems that you run into is that uh, they're not necessarily as aware of security, and if they know about it, security, they usually reject it. I, I teach at local uh, community colleges here in California, uh, so I work for one of them as an instructor, and I remember it was not even two years ago, they were at, all the faculty was asked to change their password on a regular basis, and they about had a fit. They did not want to change their passwords at all, ever have to. Uh, it's unfortunate because simple things like that 
um, uh, could really help, right? So anyways, so why are they hot targets? Well, first of all, your financials are freely available online. So cyber criminals kind of know how much money you kind of have, right? Um, they can look at a CAFR statement just as much as anybody else can, and they can look at it and say, okay, they actually have some money. If you think about it, I was just out at a, a organization, a little town. They only have 20 employees, but they make they have more money in the bank than any other local business that only has 20 employees, right? So think about it. They have more assets. So if you're going to try and get ransom from somebody, you want to target somebody that actually has money and means to pay. So that's what they're going to do. Also, a lot of organizations that only have 20 employees probably have no cybersecurity insurance. Local governments are starting to have cybersecurity insurance or it's part of their coverage or they, most of them have had something in there, maybe not as much uh, as they should have uh, in the past because they haven't had a target. Uh, but I think that that's one of the reasons. I think one of the other reasons too is that security still, compared to corporate stuff, uh, cities are still kind of lacking. Um, one of the concerns that I have as an auditor for local governments is that when local governments compare themselves with like-sized local governments, it's like, okay, great, but local governments as a whole are typically two steps below what an uh, enterprise of the same size uh, is doing for cybersecurity. And I think maybe it'd be more appropriate that local governments say, hey, based upon an amount of assets that we have or a number of computer users, how are other industries uh, uh, applying cybersecurity at that level? And kind of compare yourself there rather than amongst yourselves, right? That's just my two cents worth of that as an auditor. but. So local government is a target, if you haven't noticed, uh, it's gone so bad that uh, MSISAC has issued things saying, hey, state and local uh, and tribal governments have had an increase of 60% in 2019. That was uh, halfway through the year. Well, that was in September that they announced that. So in tw all of 2019, it may have been more than that. I haven't heard any numbers after that. Um, but uh, they're saying that you're a target, and there's so many that I, I'm not even going to go through all of them. Uh, but uh, to say that you're targeted when you realize that 20 or 23, depending on what news article you read, uh, we're all targeted at the same time by the same group in the same state, in the same geographical location. Do you think you're a target? If you're not a target or your city manager doesn't think you're a target, maybe clue them in on this information because you very much are a specific target. They're looking at local government specifically. Um, and just uh, the, the proof is in the pudding, and here it is. They are targeting uh, local governments. Re now, everybody knows about Atlanta and Baltimore, and I'm not going to get into all the particulars of it, but I just want to show you a little bit about it. Uh, they originally thought their estimate was gonna, it was going to cost $2.6 million. Uh, they had to revise that when they got done because it ended up costing them $17 million, and they're still vulnerable a year later. So in other words, they're not in any better position. They spent $17 million to recover, um, but have they really increased security to the point to get rid of those vulnerabilities? They still have the vulnerabilities that still leave them susceptible. So even if, uh, so that means there's going to be more costs related to it, uh, costs that you should have to pay. I just read uh, an article that says, um, I forgot what, I read so many articles on this stuff. Uh, one of them said, you can either pay now or pay later. You buy the security controls now or you can pay for them later after you've paid out either the ransom or you've paid out uh, for the recovery costs. So Baltimore got hit and they ended up spending $18 million. So that gives you an idea if your city is similar to the size of Atlanta and Baltimore, what your costs might be uh, to recover. Uh, some other organizations have been hit and they've been kind of close fest about, you know, talking about it. Some of them I'm aware of because I, uh, as an auditor, I know what, is going on, but they, it hasn't been publicly announced, and so can't say about those things. But uh, let's just say it's it's not necessarily very good. Um, and if you were at the MESAC conference last year, um, Port of San Diego was there, did a presentation, talked about their troubles that they had trying to recover from a uh, ransomware attack that they had. Um, and I think what he had said is it took them like six months to get everything back up and running again. Um, they had 911 got back up and running, luckily, because they had uh, extra uh, uh, laptops laying around that they could set up. Uh, but this is kind of one of those things we want to uh, look at and say, okay, uh, how, are, how prepared are we to recover? And is the business ready to take up to six months to recover everything? 
uh, at the uh, CSMFO conference last uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, one of the local governments told me that they had to rekey two years worth of financial data because they could not recover the back from the backups for the financial system. Uh, so that does not make the finance people very happy. <laughs> right? um, so uh, the recoveries can take a while, and they can be kind of somewhat expensive if you think about it. Think of employee time to having to re-enter two years' worth of financial information. Uh, that's quite a bit. Right? So it gets so bad that the state <laughs> may call a state of emergency. Um, so uh, Delaware is a good example of that. They got hit by so many different places in northern Louisiana. They just say, hey, it's a state of emergency. In the state of emergency, we kind of oftentimes think of as being like a hurricane, earthquake, something like that. You initiate your EOC and start the whole process. Well, that EOC should be initiated when something like this happens, if it's widespread. Like if one computer gets hit or one department gets hit, you don't need to initiate EOC. But if the whole city got hit or the whole district got hit, you would want to initiate that um, and then up it to your regional fusion center so that you can then get state and federal resources. However, one local government that actually went through that process uh, was told that uh, FBI and Department of Homeland Security said, oh, you have insurance folks? Uh, you should let them uh, mediate this problem. Um, the state is working on a, uh, in the uh, California National Guard is working on, and I think somebody was at the MESAC conference talking about, uh, talking about, sorry if my audio is breaking out, uh, but uh, there was a, that uh, they are working on that for the uh, California National Guard to kind of help you uh, to be able to recover. But many times they're asking you to uh, look to your insurance carrier, and, and that's an important thing to think about, which I'll bring up a little bit later, but I'll just mention it now, is your insurance coverage may cover different amounts depending upon who helps you recover. If you use their preferred vendors, they will cover a larger amount of costs uh, than if you're doing uh, a lower one. Sorry about the audio. I'm not, I'm not sure it's an IT thing. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hopefully, it doesn't. Uh, hopefully, it clears up a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same person having the same problem or if everyone's having the same problem. Um, so MS ISAC uh, received. Uh, yeah, this is just. I already talked about. This. They had said that there was 60% more. Local governments here in California, especially, I just listened to the ones here in Northern California, and I'm missing a couple actually, uh, have been hit. So it's, it, in California, local governments are a target, obviously, and we've seen a number of them uh, being hit. Uh, but again, we, we can only speculate as to why local governments are being hit. Uh, we can't really go into the minds of the criminals, although when we do capture some of them, we do ask them why they're doing it. And usually it's, it's, it's the easiest way to make some money. They typically try that. Um, but other than that, uh, there's not a lot of insight in, in some, like, a specific reason why they're doing it. Uh, yeah, I can hear a little bit of crackling too. I'm not sure. Uh, yes, there will be a link for download later. After the session's over, you will be able to download all of this, and you'll be able to rewatch this. So who are the bad guys that are um, running all of this? Uh, most of them are cyber criminals, and they're looking to make money. Uh, some people want to make a, uh, uh, just want to make a statement like a hacktivist. They just break into systems to, you know, make a statement, whatever it is. Um, and then some of them just want destruction. Um, is that uh, we see that nation states oftentimes will launch a ransomware attack, and it's not even ransomware, it's just malware acting like ransomware, and the whole entire point is to actually break down systems. We saw this when Russia invaded the nation of Georgia, and when Russia launched an attack against the Ukraine, both of those were preemptive before that with a cyber attack, um, and also just kind of information warfare in general. But uh, the cyber attack uh, from NotPetya when they were attacking the Ukraine, it, Ukraine was the target, but other organizations around the world got hit because once the, um, once the, what, what, I don't know how to say it, once the virus kind of gets out, um, it's out. Right? 
what are you going to do? Uh, and then he kind of just goes everywhere, and everybody kind of becomes a target for that. Uh, so the bad guys, kind of knowing what they're, they're doing, there's a lot of different things that they look at. They look at doing crypto jacking. Actually, actually, the easiest way for them to make money is to just break into your system and hide. If they've been ransomware, they have to break into the system and then convince you, lock the system out and then convince you to pay. And the data theft, they have to be able to download the information out of your network without you knowing it, and then they have to have a buyer on the dark net to sell it, right? So um, we do talk a little bit about that here in, in the next slides, but I don't need to really address it. I think most of it is the data breach, one of the reasons why local governments probably have not had an issue in the past is that a data breach does not, is not an easy way for them to make money. Right? Uh, if they breach your data, um, it's, uh, they have to be able to sell the data. And you don't really have a whole lot of data that wants to be sold, other than maybe personnel information, right? Your HR data and all that kind of stuff. Maybe your credit card numbers. Um, so PCI or, or credit card stuff is going to be much more important to protect and the HR information. Other than that, there's not much they can sell of yours. And it doesn't stop them from breaking into your system. They're breaking your systems all the time, and they post stuff on the dark web. There's a city in Florida that had terabytes of police cam footage that was just posted on the dark net. The cyber criminals did not ask for a ransom. They didn't try to sell it. They just posted it. Is that a good or bad thing? I don't know. It's just letting you know that they do do it for sometimes uh, unknown motive, motives. Um, in order for cyber criminals to make money with ransomware, all they have to do is break into your system and lock it up and then convince you to pay. So in order to convince you to pay, they try to make it as difficult as possible for you to continue operations. Make it as painful as possible. Think about, you know, a collection agent from, you know, uh, from Godfather, right? Somebody like Guido, he's coming to collect. Uh, what's he going to want to do? He wants to make it hurt as much as possible to encourage you to pay. Uh, so that's what they try to do. They try to encourage as much as possible to get you to pay. Uh, crypto jacking, breaking your system and using it to mine for bitcoins, uh, that's just, it, it's easy for them to do. All they have to do is hide. As long as they're not using 100% of the resources of the device, you may not notice it. Uh, you'll hear, people are always complaining to IT that their computers are running slow, right? <laughs> so, so are you really going to know? Uh, so uh, that might be part of uh, uh, one of the things that we see an increase in is crypto jacking because uh, it can be easily done. Department of Defense didn't even know on their private network that they had uh, Bitcoin mining going on. So this is interesting. If they didn't know what was going on, and then a bug tracker find it, it would have to be in our organizations too. That becomes one of the questions that we have. Increasingly, we're seeing that they combined all of those things uh, as any business uh, individual or organization would do. They would try to diversify and make money as many ways as possible. Uh, and this is one of the ways uh, to do that. Um, so if they can do a data breach ransom and crypto jacking, they will uh, try and do that. Uh, and there's not much we can do. And again, all this is designed to increase the likelihood that you will pay. I'm going to take one minute right now and see if I can change my phone. Since I don't know if the phone is on Brightbox's end or on my end. Um, so let me, if you just give me one moment uh, for a break, uh, I will try dialing in from my cell phone and we'll see how that goes. I'm still working on it. Give me just a moment. Welcome to Bright Talk Prisoner Live. If you're presenting a live webcast today, please enter the eight digit pin you've been provided using your telephone key. This live webcast is in progress. If you are not presenting, please hang up now. If you are presenting, then stand by. We are now putting you into the live presentation. After the beat, the music will stop, and your voice will be heard live by your online audience. Okay, folks. I, 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 okay, um, 
just want to do an audio check and see if you guys can hear me a little bit better now. Am I coming in clearer? If you can uh, put a chat in there just so I know. Hopefully it's not as bad. But if it is as bad, then it's probably a bright talk thing, not a my thing. Okay. So I hung up on that one. I'm just on this one. So hopefully that will be a lot better going forward. Sorry about that. Uh, so other business opportunities. So one of the things that we've noticed with the bad guys is they are not above trying to make money any other possible way that they can. One of the things that we found that they're doing is um, they like repeat customers, <laughs> just like any business does. Um, and uh, many victims are actually hit multiple times, so they like that. Uh, and they like to com combine revenue things by like doing a data breach and doing that. Now, local governments, again, you don't have a lot for them to do a data breach with and try and sell. So we don't see that a whole bunch on local governments other than trying to get you to pay by saying, we're going to put this information on the dark web uh, or on the Internet, right, uh, as a, a threat to try and get you to pay a little bit more. Um, so, And they also sell <laughs> ransomware kits. Uh, to other hackers so that they can hack into people. And I just saw a article the other day that somebody was hacking their boss uh, and got their boss to get ransomware. Uh, kind of more like a disgruntled employee type of thing. Uh, so anyways, uh, so it's market driven. They're going to go where the money is. So if you pay, they're more likely to do it. So not paying is a really good idea to do it. So when they attack, they try to get into your system, hide in your system, move around your system, try and find different places to hide. Uh, stay in it before they execute. Um, and th there's a reason for them going through this process and why I'm telling you this, because when they get into your system, they don't necessarily just launch the attack immediately. They wait, um, and they wait a while, and they try other things to try and break into your system. So, uh, and they try to get revenue other ways, like trying to get um, uh, credentials for somebody in finance so that they can try and uh, get into their email uh, so that they can try and set up wire transfers that transfer money outside the organization. And if the people don't fall for that, then they might launch the ransomware attack. So we're starting to see sophisticated attacks where the criminals are trying to maximize their potential for getting as much money out of you as possible, including, you know, doing a wire transfer, which you would think is kind of non-related. But if they're in your systems, um, they may try other uh, things in there. How are they getting into it? Most of it's social engineering. Uh, some type of phishing attack or something like that, sometimes from browsers. Uh, unpatched systems are the bane of our existence. Uh, remote access and obsolete software and services are their biggest targets once in. So uh, we just want to let you know that if you're still running Windows 7, you got a big target on your back, or you at least got a big hole in your system. Um, and uh, because there's no more patches, unless you pay for them, and even those that you're paying for, are not necessarily going to be the mainstream ones. So they're, Microsoft's not spending any money trying to find vulnerabilities in Windows 7 anymore. And by the way, Windows 7, Windows 10's been out for what, how long now? Six, well, not, not six years, but it's been out for a while. So it's not like you're like, oh, I'm unexpected that Windows 7's ending. Um, no, it shouldn't be. I understand that a lot of organizations are having budget issues with that. This is why senior management needs to understand the risk. Right, um, and they need to understand it at a forceful level. What we have found in the different data breach things, and Verizon always does their data breach report uh, each year. Typically, they release it at RSA, but 2018 data breach basically said that 93% of breaches are related to some type of social engineering. Right, so uh, that doesn't mean that other factors didn't play a part. Yes, unpatched systems might be like 83%, and you say, well, that's more than 100%. It's because the link or the, phish, the phishing email plus the unpatch system is how the guys got in, the bad guys got in, right? It's never just one cause. It's usually a cascade or multiple controls failing uh, that lets them into the system. So uh, anyways, uh, and you, you all know, I'm, talking, I'm preaching to the choir on this one, uh, there's always going to be one employee in your organization going to click on something, and then they're going to, uh, you know, launch some kind of malware attack against your organization, right? Um, so here's a good example of one. This one was just I came across this just the other day. Uh, Greenville Water District had a cyber attack, and it was because an employee clicked on a phishing email. Um, because employees have clicked on a phishing email, 
we've had an uptick in wire transfer frauds that have been happening. And because if they get them to click on a link that says, hey, you're off of 365, or you need to reset your email account password, or you need to verify it, um, they can set up a website to hackers that looks like any website that's out there to try and trick people into uh, t typing their username and password. Once they have their credential, then they try to log into it. This is why multi-factor authentication is really, really popular. Um, but we're having local government um, doing inappropriate and not inappropriate, being tricked into doing wire transfers that are costing millions of dollars. So it's, this is a big issue now too. Um, but again, that's just a side one. We're still talking about ransomware in this one. I, I'm just letting you know there's other risks related to this. And hackers understand that if they can get past your employees, um, they're, they're in your system. Um, and when we do a pen test or something like that, we'll take a USB stick and we'll drop it in the parking lot, see if somebody picks it up and sticks it in their computer, because that's a really good way to get in there. That is not as successful as you would think. It's, you know, 20 to 40 percent uh, success rate that somebody's going to pick it up, plug it in the computer. But you know what we found out, or what you know, other pen testers have found out? If I take that USB stick and I put your city logo on it or your district logo on it, it gets up to like 97% success rate that someone's going to plug it in for us to get the code on the system. That's huge, right? So what is it? That's, that's your last and first and last line of defense are your employees. Um, so that becomes super important right there that they uh, do it. What we have found, and this average of 180 days is, is a little bit old. It's kind of like maybe two years old since I heard that. But I haven't heard an update of that uh, from any of the organizations talking about what is the average time that before that a, that a hacker gets in your system before they're found out. So it's about six months. They can do a lot in six months, right? Once they gain access to your system, they're hiding in it. And you don't even know it. And what we have found is they're hiding in low-priority systems. They're hiding in phone systems. They're hiding in printers. They're hiding in projectors. Things that are connected to the network that we don't normally think of as being vulnerable or that even, you know, half of the printers out there have websites, you know, running on them. Uh, we don't think about that necessarily in IT. Um, we should, all right? I, and here's another thing. When we come in as auditors and, and someone says, I ask them, how many devices you have? We're going to do either we're doing vulnerability scans for them or we're uh, setting up, you know, some type of network monitoring system, and uh, they'll say, oh, we've got X amount of devices. Uh, I always come back, and it's almost twice as much as what they say, because they forget, oh, yeah, connected to our system is this, and then we have this ICS system, and then, oh, yeah, the parking meter, straw about that, oh, yeah, the traffic lights. They forget about all these other things that are also connected on the network. Um, Printers, devices, a conference room, control panels, door control panels, cameras, all those other IoT, Internet of Things devices, oftentimes slip through, but those oftentimes are the places where people hide. Um, and so we want to know where all those things are. Um, even in our own network, when I had an assessment done, I thought I had a really good idea on all this. That I'm very particular about it. and I'm the auditor, right? So we have ways of trying to keep track of everything. Everything comes in, we write it down, we thought we had it. Um, we didn't have 50% more devices, but we had like 10% more devices than we thought we had. Um, we forgot, oh yeah, there's this thing. Oh yeah, we have uh, the payment term. Oh yeah, we have this. There's all these other things that sometimes slip through the crack. Uh, so even if you think you know everything, um, we find that there's a lot of places for those bad guys to hide. They like to move around, do some reconnaissance, try to find other systems to infect, one of the things they always look for is the backups to see where they are. They try to attack the backups. One of the reasons for doing that is you're more likely to pay if you have no backup, right? Um, so their number one target before they launch and target on the overall system is to target the backups. So air gapping backups is super uh, important, right? So you want to check that out as well. Um, they try to stay in, so they kind of run silent, run deep, kind of invade your detection efforts. Um, so this is one of the uh, difficult things is, like, there's not a lot of great software out there that's going to kind of help with this stuff. Uh, there are some things, but most of those are much more expensive. Um, and then some of it requires that you have someone monitoring that stuff to respond to all those things. Um, and uh, we find that there's just a, so many events that happen. Great, you have log management. 
now you have all these events. Are you looking at all of them, right? Uh, so that becomes kind of uh, the next issue. And they like, as I already said before, they like to be, they want you to be return customers. So once they break into a system, they will like to go back to that system and reinfect it. In fact, we had one organization got hit three times. They thought they cleaned everything up. One of the places that it ended up being is in the phone system. So once they're in your systems and then get into as many systems as they possibly can, then they can launch the attack and their whole goal is to get the maximum impact to business operations. In other words, they want to grind you to a halt. Um, they want to bring everything down because the more they make it hurt, the more likely you are to pay. And that's kind of what their, their goal is and what they're trying to do. So again, knowing this kind of helps us kind of figure out, okay, uh, now you might be thinking in your head, okay, mitigation strategies. What am I going to do if they are trying to do this? What are some things that I can do to kind of minimize that impact, right? So this is part of, you're all now thinking in your head, we're working through the process, although we're not officially calling it risk management, but we're doing that. Um, as you're starting to think about what types of things you would do. Uh, one of their recent places that was hit was hit with the Raikou virus. They got hit three times. They hid in systems like the phone systems. It took a month to resolve. They actually needed outside support, uh, which if anyone gets hit, you're probably going to need outside support. Do you have those uh, uh, support already negotiated? You don't want to be negotiating when you're having a problem. You want to make sure that you have everything set. Uh, we just wrote an instant response plan for one of our local governments, and we had to tailor it to the insurance company, uh, the insurance company's requirements, because they have requirements that if your staff tries to recover before their staff gets on site, they're not going to cover X amount, right? That is something, that's a huge provision in an insurance policy that you need to be aware of in your instant response plan, because clicking one key could change, they may, co they may cover, you know, millions of dollars less. Um, so you, that needs to be understood. Uh, and part of that is going through, looking at your current incident response plan, figuring out, one, if it's adequate, and then two, uh, is it alignment, is it aligned with what your insurance policy says? Uh, and then you have contact information very quickly so that you can get to uh, those outside sources as quickly as possible to get them on uh, boots on the ground to help you recover. Again, part of it is minimizing the impact. So obviously containing it's really important, but then also the recovery aspect is, is well. Uh, the organization that got hit, they had insurance, but whether it's adequate or not uh, is yet to be seen because there's still process of uh, uh, figuring out exactly what the whole cost was to it. The other thing is, uh, this was an interesting part that we found out, is management had a vague notion that there was something out there called ransomware and that, some, you know, that they might, you know, other, uh, yeah, Atlanta got hit. You know, so they had this vague notion of it, but they had no specific idea on how to address it or what the impact would be to them. So this is an important case study here in that uh, management just kind of had a vague notion, so they were aware of it, but not enough for them to actually make risk-based decisions. Um, so that's what we want to get to the point is that they can make risk-based decisions on that. Um, yeah, and again, there's just so many things that keep on getting hit. Um, so breaches are going to occur. We know that. But what we want to do is limit the impact. If we can limit the impact, that's a win. Um, you know, in cybersecurity, oftentimes it used to be that, you know, if you got hacked, uh, that was the death nail for you as an IT security person. And it's like, you know, we call it a career-ending move or a, a, a time when you need to adjust your resume. Um, well, uh, in this case, it's not anymore because it's it's now starting to be understood that you are target, you're going to get hit, and really what's important is do you have the means to limit the impact? Uh, and if you can, that can be a win for the organization. Uh, so what are some of the trends that we're seeing? Uh, they're moving from being indiscriminate to be much more targeted, like spear phishing targeted. Um, we've had information used in phishing emails information that was presented at a council meeting that was uh, live broadcast on the internet but wasn't in um, any of the on um, the agenda documents. So that means a hacker had to have watched the city council meeting to find something that they could use to sucker somebody into clicking a link or doing whatever it was that they asked them to do. This is how targeted they are. Um, and because we are so open, uh, we're, we're starting to see that um, 
they're using that information against us. I had a question about cloud-based services, and actually I do have some information on it in a little bit. So I will answer that question here in a little bit. Um, uh, we also see that they're hitting multiple uh, organizations multiple times, and we're now seeing that they're targeting industrial control systems, their operational OT uh, items, uh, and IoT. So they're hitting those things. I don't know if you've seen, uh, there was an article somewhere, uh, I think it was on Dark Reading or something like that, somebody bricked their phone, or uh, their TV. Uh, they got ransomware on their TV, and they called, I, I think it was Sony, they called them up and said, hey, I got uh, ransomware, what can I do for it? They said, that's not under warranty. <laughs> so what do you do? You go to Costco and buy another TV. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of what ends up happening. Uh, so we see that. Um, and again, like we said, they're targeting uh, industrial control systems now, especially water districts um, and other, you know, sanitation districts. But there's a caveat there. Uh, the targets, a lot of them are coming from Iran right now, which is a nation state, and they're not looking <coughs> necessarily for a payment. They're just looking to hurt uh, the United States in general. And I figure if they hurt a local government, they're hurting us as a whole. The other thing is, um, and I already kind of talked about this, this combo idea, we're starting to see them to threaten to release information that they found. And you would think with a local government, because this, you know, uh, citizens can call up and say, hey, uh, I want to see every email related to X, you know, under some type of freedom of information type of thing, uh, that, you know, people in a local government would not be sending emails that were not work appropriate. Uh, and, and yet it still happens. And, um, and they're threatening to release those types of things into the wild um, if uh, the ransom isn't paid. So again, try and maximize the, uh, the hurt to it. Uh, if they do break in and they got HR information, then that, that's another liability, another cost uh, that the city is now going to incur um, if that information was disclosed. So um, again, after a year, Atlantic City was uh, still, con uh, Atlanta, not Atlantic City, sorry. Atlanta was still vulnerable for it, uh, even a year after it. So. Uh, I don't know what their current status is, but that should be a warning to all of us that, hey, uh, a lot of organizations are struggling, um, other local governments even outside of the United States um, are struggling with this same problem of being targeted and having so much. Uh, so question about cloud services, are they better or what, you know, what's the deal with that? Um, they're, they click the gov, which is one of the, uh, 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 the cloud service that a lot of different uh, local governments are using got hit, right? And eight cities that were using it were uh, did that. And this just came out yesterday or today uh, that says ransomware is now trying to look at cloud service providers. Um, they're trying to hit it. Now, cloud service providers typically have more resources to protect um, whatever part they're in charge of managing. But here's the thing with cloud services, and maybe we need to do a presentation on this, because as an auditor, uh, it's not that easy. It's not an easy question to answer because the question really, when you talk about risk and then um, what's the risk that you have to using the cloud? Well, it depends upon what cloud service provider you're using and then what level of cloud service provider. Are you using infrastructure as a service where you're responsible to update the uh, virtual machines or are you running an application where the virtual machine patching is the responsibility of the cloud service provider? Right? Those are going to be two different levels of risk that you're going to have. Uh, in addition to that, uh, looking at um, uh, sometimes you have a cloud service provider like click to gov but does click to gov actually have the data center, or are they running the data center in AWS or Google or Azure? You don't know sometimes. Sometimes you find out, sometimes you don't. So what we have found is that some of the software that local governments use, because it's such a small market, uh, like the financial system, uh, that oftentimes they're actually running on AWS or Azure. They're running a virtual machine on AWS or Azure, and they're responsible for uh, maintaining the security on the virtual machine, and you're responsible for the application level of uh, the security, and the infrastructure level is the responsibility of AWS or Azure. So now you've got three different organizations involved in the cloud service provider with three different levels of responsibility to make sure that you're doing all the security things you need to be doing. So that's why it's not an easy answer. Sorry. Uh, 
but you have to, you should do an assess, risk assessment anytime that you're going to engage in any of these things, like getting a new financial system or a new, um, you know, Parks and Rec wants to get a new system for class registration and processing credit cards. There's a lot of risk there, and you need to kind of like be able to look at all those different risks at all those different levels so that whoever's making the decision to use whatever software is informed about what the risks are. Um, I will tell you that out of all of the three, and I don't want to pick on Microsoft, but I actually prefer them because one of the things they do is their audit reports are, you don't have to ask for them. You just go in there and you can look and you can actually pull down the audit report for the cloud service that you're in. And you can see how well they're doing based upon their reports. Uh, other organizations are very, um, they're not as, forthcoming with them, or you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, or there's all these other caveats you have to do, and you have to jump through a bunch of loops to get them. Uh, I appreciate the fact that someone's just going to be transparent. Uh, so anyways, uh, but that's, that's a whole other topic for a whole other conversation, which we can do at a later date. Are you ready? <laughs> right? Uh, the Atlanta CEO said basically, we're not here necessarily to stop attacks, we're here to prepare for the inevitable. And I like that. And uh, being a uh, one of the things that we also find, one of the struggles that you're going to have is that security thing, people are starting to say, you know what, yeah, Equifax got hacked, Target got hacked, yeah, yeah, hack, 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 hack. So I feel like sometimes, you know, I'm chicken little running around saying, hey, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. The problem is it actually is. Uh, and everybody's like, well, you know, Target breach happened, and it wasn't that big of a deal to me. I got a new credit card. Um, so when Equifax happened, it's not that big of a deal. The problem is the type of data that was breached in Equifax is huge compared to what was uh, broken in with Target. Target, you just got a brand new credit card. Bank took care of any losses if there was any. You were inconvenienced while you were waiting for a new credit card. But if you think about it, Equifax, the information that was taken, which is all of your information, all your credit history, all your work history, anything that any other organization uh, reports on you, including social security number, was compromised. And now that information 10 years from now can be used against you. And by the way, just the other day, we kind of already suspected this, that uh, they've indicted some Chinese hackers uh, for that Equifax breach, just as a side note. Um, but we kind of already, in the security industry, we kind of already knew, we just didn't have proof type of thing. Uh, and I'm still not sure exactly what the proof is, but anyways, that's not forthcoming. But uh, the fact that it was them, it kind of makes sense because we did not see anybody trying to sell it on the dark web. Uh, but also, interesting fact, correlation, and side note, uh, the hack that happened to the Office of Personnel Management with the federal government, which maintains who has what security clearances in the federal government, also got hacked uh, years ago. And now they can correlate, uh, and that was done by China, uh, and now they have the ability to correlate those two data sets um, to actually use people for recruiting it for espionage. Um, that seems to be very clear that that is what their goal is uh, with the available information. Um, and if it's not, uh, it's unfortunate because other people have already said that. And they're, if they didn't think about it now, they're already going to be trying it. So anyways, um, so there's uh, all the, the stuff is, is coming out about cybersecurity. And now we're starting to see a lot of more local governments are saying, hey, uh, do we pay or do we not pay? U.S. Mayor's uh, Association said don't pay. FBI said, well, we're going, to, we're going to change gears on that. We used to say don't pay, but now we understand you need operations back up and running, so maybe you should pay. Um, one of the things, uh, part of the incident response process is figure out what type of uh, malware you were hacked with to figure out if it's used by hackers that do give you back your information uh, and make sure that it's not going to a likely nation state. Here's the thing. If it's cyber criminals and you pay it, um, which for a local government to pay criminals is problematic to say the least, right? Um, but we'll talk about that later. But, but here's the thing, for a local government to pay when the likely recipient is North Korea, Iran, Russia, it's a little bit harder to swallow, right? And it may even cross the line legally uh, uh, because you're aiding and abetting not a criminal, but you know a nation state that it may be at war with us. Um, so, yes, not a decision I would like to have to make. So, good question to ask your different department heads. Go to finance, go to parks and rec, go everywhere, and say, how long can you effectively and efficiently operate without any technology or data? If I shut off all the computers and you have no data, no computers, how are you going to do your job? 
that should be a wake-up call to them. Uh, and you might want to ask them how much downtime they want, right? Uh, this is the first question you have to ask in order to get the appropriate amount of budget for these things, right? Um, so sometimes you do an assessment. We come in sometimes and do an assessment of all the applications, all the departments, figure out what, you know, with, uh, what, one, it helps you figure out what needs to be prioritized for recovery purposes, but then also just to find out, you know, um, how important is each one of these applications to each of these different departments? IT doesn't always know that, and it's really hard for IT to always know. Uh, one time we found out that there was an application that was in Parks and Rec, nobody in Parks and Rec was using anymore, but IT kept on buying it because they thought they needed it. That's a waste of money, right? So um, trying to figure this out, asking these questions is a good thing uh, to do as you go through it. What's the impact to an organization? Recent article just came out, talk about all the different things impact-wise. People couldn't pay utility bills. Jail doors couldn't be opened remotely. Badging scanners didn't work. Couldn't do back wear and checks. Couldn't do checks on uh, active warrants. Uh, 911 systems went out. Oh, you know, it runs the gambit. Anything's on a computer, right? Uh, I don't have to give you a list for that. You can kind of guess uh, all the things that we use computers for and data for today. Um, Oftentimes, devices, especially IoT devices, are bricked and they're gone, right? Uh, you're just replacing those, which is a cost. So how much does it cost? That's a question everybody always asks. Well, statistically from 2019, what we're looking at is about a total of $7.5 billion in cost last year uh, nationwide on um, all the different uh, attacks that we're aware of, right? There's a lot of attacks that we're not aware of and the people may have cleaned up stuff and we're not aware of how much they paid for it, right? Um, based on that, how many organizations got hit, we can come up with a safe average of $8.1 million is the average cost uh, of, of being infected with ransomware. Uh, now, obviously, if you're a larger organization, it's going to be higher, like Atlanta, Baltimore, we know it was much higher. And if you're a smaller organization, I think the town of Albany, New York, had a very minimal impact. Um, in other words, they had ransomware on a few machines, not all the machines. And I want to say they had reported it was like $300,000. So you're going to understand there's going to be some on the low end, depending on how hard they hit you, and then there's going to be some on the high end uh, that are going to be, you know, in the tens of millions of dollars. Um, so with asking the question, how much insurance do you need to get, right? Well, now you have a kind of a range of where you need to have your insurance, and you kind of figure out, okay, where do we feel happy? I would almost say almost the average for most local governments, I said the average of 8.1 million is probably a good place to start. Uh, I see a lot of organizations have three or five when we evaluate uh, their insurance policies, um, and that's probably not enough. Uh, especially three is not really enough because um, now the ransom where, uh, ransoms are being increased on how much they're asking for. Now let's look at the ransom versus how about the recovery cost with some of those things. Uh, Atlanta, they only asked for $52,000. Recovery cost was $17 million. So you have to ask your question. You have, you have to ask the question is, do we recover or, or do we pay the ransom? Now, I don't want to be the city manager or the city council to make that decision, right? I mean, they're, they're the ones who have to make a decision, but that's not a decision that I would want to have to make. That's, a, that's like there's no good answer to that. Because think about it, you're going to have a council meeting, citizens are going to come in and say, why didn't you pay the ransom? You would have saved, you know, $16 million or seven, almost $17 million. And then if you pay the ransom, then someone's going to come in and complain that you, you know, there's no, it's a no-win scenario. If you pay attention to Star Trek, it's the Kobayashi Maru. There's no way to win this. If you get hit, someone's going to be mad about it, uh, whether you pay or, or you have a lot of expenses. Now, you pay the ransom, and then you go and try and make sure that they're out of the system and clean up the system so you don't become a repeat customer, uh, and then finally spend the money on cybersecurity, um, you're still going to be paying more than the ransom, which still is going to not be $18 million, right? So anyway, anyway, so remember what the totals are. And I like to put the numbers with all the zeros after it to kind of give you the impact of how much this costs. $7.5 billion total last year average being 8.1, right? It's a lot of money. And most local governments don't have extra money to be throwing around. So let's try and keep as much of it as possible. Other things that get affected, uh, obviously downtime, lost revenue, reputation, uh, recovery costs, forensic costs, injury response costs, uh, cybersecurity consulting costs, security controls that you have to buy that you didn't have in the first place, overtime costs, insurance streams going up, legal fees. Um, and a new one, bond rating may go down. 
uh, you might see you may not be as concerned about the bond rating, but if your city borrows money and has bonds, that bond rating is very important on, you know, how much money you can get and how much of a bond you get. So uh, that actually affects, uh, you know, multiple years worth of potential income for uh, the local government. So bond rating is kind of an important thing, and that can be impacted as well. So, again, insurers are kind of up the, uh, the rate because of their exposure. So expect that if you – whatever you paid this year for cybersecurity insurance is probably going to be up next year, unfortunately. So they'll have to budget for that. And guess what? Because you have more money than most local government or most other organizations that you're same size, that you typically pay more, 10 times more, um, if you do pay the ransom. So not fair, but that's what it is. Now I'm going to start changing gears here. I'm kind of scared you to death, hopefully. Um, and now let's talk about what we need to do to fix it. So first thing we need to do is we need to understand cyber risk is business risk. And one of the things I always have a problem with is as soon as I try to talk to a city manager, they're like, oh, IT, here, go talk to the IT director. Uh, and I'm like, no, you don't understand. I'm not here to talk to the IT director. He already knows this stuff. I'm here to talk to you about what your responsibility is. Um, uh, and they need to understand that cyber risk is business risk. So we kind of change the way we talk about things these days because as soon as I say IT, they're like, eh. They turn off their ears. It's like they stick their fingers in their ears and go, la, 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 I can't hear you. Go talk to IT, uh, unfortunately. Um, but so there's been a lot of guidance that's been put out. The Journal of Accounts just came out with the other day, February 3rd. I mean, this is like hot off the presses. Uh, they just came out and said, hey, there's three things you need to do to – all right, there, there's more than three things that you need to do. This is like at a super high 100,000-mile view of what you need to do. Um, anyways, uh, but – this is a useful type of information that you can give to the finance director or to the city manager say, hey, there's stuff we need to do to fix this. And the three little things are not probably enough. So anyways, um, there's new guidance. This is hot off the press today um, that they're giving guidance to local schools, but it's, there's a lot about keeping children safe online and dealing with cyber bullies and a little bit about you know ransomware and stuff like that. Not very much, unfortunately. Um, so what we like to push people towards is the inter, uh, interagency document that the uh, Department of Homeland Security and other agencies kind of came up with on how you can protect yourself from ransomware. Um, and uh, basically what you can do is kind of learn from other people. So they're updating this information based upon uh, actual attacks and what they know has happened to try and let you be prepared for it. Uh, this document's a little bit cumbersome. They talk about things at a high level at some times and at a very minute level at another time. Um, so we kind of came up with a checklist that's free that you can download from our website. You can, get, you can just download it for free. Um, we give it away. Um, that is a checklist you can go through and you can answer the question. Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Are your backups air gap, right? All that kind of stuff. We just put it out there. We're not trying to charge anybody for it because we just want you to get secure. Um, so check that out. Uh, I know that one of our clients um, that we're doing the risk assessment for put it out on the MESAC forum. So it, it's out there. Um, and we'll update it as things come out. NIST just came out with some draft guidance. There's nothing new in the draft guidance that wasn't covered in our checklist, but uh, uh, if there's anything else, because things are changing in the last three months, a lot of stuff has changed. So what should you do? Take the questionnaire, fill it out, and then take that to senior management and give them a report and tell them where you are at um, and be honest with it. Don't try to sugarcoat it and say that you guys are better off than you are. If you're not good, tell them. Um, they need to know the good, the bad, the ugly, right? Whatever it is. If you're doing a good job, then tell them, hey, look, we have this checklist, we went through it, all this. Um, anyways, so run internal scans if you don't do them. Um, when we do the risk assessment for somebody else, we'll answer the question, we go through the questionnaire with them, make sure they understand what the question's asking. Um, and then we also do an internal scan, so you could do an internal scan yourself, so we know what the vulnerabilities are, right? Because part of the equation is, okay, what controls do we have in place? That's what the questionnaire is for. And then how vulnerable we are, that's what the internal scans are for. Um, it, you can also do some phishing attempts to kind of see if poise will click on anything. Guarantee I can get one of your employees to click on something. So just assume that someone's going to click on something. I haven't had a successful phishing uh, uh, a thing that we've run where we couldn't get somebody to click. Um, so take that into consideration. Just kind of there's a high risk there already. Uh, so review your insurance. 
do a gap analysis, uh, come up with a list of what you need to fix based on the questionnaire. If the questionnaire says you have air gap uh, uh, backups and you don't, there's your remediation. Come up with air gap uh, backups. Uh, make a report and make a presentation for uh, management. When we do the risk assessment, that's what we do. Uh, we go through the whole entire thing and somebody said, do you take the report to council? Difficult decision, don't take specific information. You need to be at a very high level because again, we've already know the bad guys watch council meetings. So if they're watching, you don't wanna air out all your dirty laundry and tell them that you're still running Windows 7 and you don't do patch management because they will use that information against you. So it is not appropriate to be a council meeting type of report. Um, it needs to be handled as security sensitive information, uh, which should have an exemption uh, from a public disclosure as well. So again, same type of thing. It's not that breaches are going to occur, but how, how can we limit the impact again? Um, so it's, and again, what the CIO uh, from Atlanta says, it's less about preventing it and being able to respond when it happens, right? Um, and as a Marine veteran, of course, I like uh, my Marines. So General Mathis once said, if you want the fewest big regrets when surprise strikes, you must provide ahead of time the doctrine and resources to respond. Uh, one thing that we always say when I was in the military, it's better to sweat in training than bleed in battle. Um, and that's exactly what it is. And so let me give you a very common uh, way of saying that that you probably heard. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Uh, and in this case, an ounce of prevention is worth a whole truckload of cure. Um, so preparing for these things is the most important thing that you could be working on. Um, rather than trying to uh, do all that. Uh, again, the, the checklist is there, download it, use it. Uh, we recent, well, it's not been recently updated, but uh, we're working on a new update. We're checking on a couple different things before we do that update. Um, the checklist comes from more than that, just that interagency guidance. It comes from this guidance. It comes from uh, UK uh, government also came up with some guidance. Canada, uh, New Zealand, and Australia did, and I kind of made sure that we kind of covered everything that the, all of them were talking about, including some private industry reports. So it's the most comprehensive that I know of that's available, and that's why there's a lot of questions, and it's not three things that you have to do. It's uh, a number of things, I forget what it was, like 80 something numbers? I forget, anyways, 80 controls or something like that. Let me talk about them in a high level. Uh, so uh, in the questionnaire, um, I talk about making a presentation to executive management. In other words, we wanna make sure that they understand what the risk is um, to their system. And uh, on the right-hand side of these slides over here, you see I have the NIST cybersecurity framework, IDRA-5 and IDDE-3. That's telling you where, where in the security standards that already exist, you should be doing these things. Right. All right. So here, here's where it is. You have a risk assessment uh, done on a regular basis. The NISC risk management framework, which is different than the cybersecurity framework, it's what the federal government uses. It's what I would recommend that you use um, because it's a little bit more thorough. Um, automatically has instilled in the whole entire process management involvement in the decision making process. In fact, management, like the finance manager, has to sign off before the finance server goes into live production. That's what the risk management framework, if you use it, requires. Cybersecurity framework doesn't require you to do that, and it only has high-level objectives. It doesn't have specific controls. The risk management framework has those controls that are a little bit more enhanced, a little bit more in-depth. Uh, but again, that's a whole other conversation. What I want you to know is on the slides here on the right-hand side, I'm giving you the reference so that you can reference back to different security standards that you can go back to. Um, so one of the things we also recommend is that management with, you know, counsel uh, before you're in the heat of battle, so to speak, that you plan, are we even going to entertain the idea of paying a ransom, right? Have that conversation when heads are cool, when everybody's not stressed out, when the whole city's not on its knees, right? You want to make sure that you have that, those types of conversations ahead of time um, uh, before that. Um, and then you wanna make sure that you give them a report. This is, we have to link the cyber risk to the business risk, right? So that's a part of what you do. This is like a page out of our report, you know, and when you're talking to uh, executive management, you gotta show them kind of like graphs, you know, this is high, medium, low. 
Uh, we've done a number of local governments, and it's high or critically high. Uh, is we haven't found any way that's moderate level risk. Um, and this is based upon what we know about actual local governments that have been hit. We use them as a baseline to determine uh, what kind of controls not being in place and what their impact is to it. So senior management needs to understand that risk and like how likely it is to happen, and then what is the potential impact, right? Um, and then when you make your report to them, then you can help guide their decision-making process. Um, and that's what the whole point of that is to do. All of this kind of falls under governance, and I, I kind of stick this in here because we have a general like recommendation when we do the risk assessment is that you put in proper IT governance. The problem is we say IT governance, um, again, people stick their fingers in there and go blah, 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 I don't hear it, go talk to IT. So we've actually kind of changed the way we talk about it. We now call it enterprise governance of information and technology. And there's two different goals with that. You put processes and stuff in place. This is not IT management. This is above that. You put processes in place that one, gets management involved in the process, but two, that there's a way that they can figure out that there's value from the information and the technology that they're using, and that uh, we are ensuring that the risks are identified and addressed and mitigated. Um, if you want help with getting budget, this is what you need to implement, um, because this gets them at the table, it gets you at the table, and it makes sure everybody is on the same page. And you get, you get to tell them what the risk is, or you have a secure, somebody that's you know, dedicated to cybersecurity that tells them what the risk is so that they know what it is. And so you can say, hey, I told you what the risk is. You guys make the decision. And if they make the decision and you told them not to, and they did, then that's CYA, right? You know, that's part of what it is. But it's also just letting them know what, you know, so they can make informed decisions. Uh, most of them have a vague risk vague understanding of what the risk is. They don't actually know specifically what the risk is. So cybersecurity insurance, first thing you do is look at it and see if you have adequate coverage. How much does it cover? Is there any exclusions, right? Uh, and is there any discounts for preparation? Do they have any help to help you prepare? Uh, I know BSAC recently had a webcast for last year sometime about cybersecurity insurance. I don't know if that's still available, but you want to go check that out, uh, see what they talked about it. But what we've noticed in there, and I think they even talked about it in there, uh, is that there can be exclusions in there uh, if you don't use their uh, approved vendors for uh, forensics and recovery. So make sure you look at that. Uh, again, NIST standards kind of cover those things as a part of the risk management uh, process. And how much insurance? Again, everybody always asks that question. Baltimore, they had $18 million in losses. They bought $20 million worth of insurance, right? So if the average is eight, you know, you can kind of have a good ballpark there, uh, but talk to your risk managers about that. Um, and some of those companies, because they haven't, they haven't been paying claims very much lately, I mean, cyber insurance is kind of somewhat new. Um, so there's not a lot of actuarial tables of losses yet. So a lot of the insurance companies are kind of hit and miss right now, but they are going to have actuarial tables that are going to be, they don't lose money. <laughs> Um, the only people that seem to make money out of insurance is the insurance companies, right? Well, they, the reason for that is because they know their numbers, and that is what insurance is all about, knowing how likely something is to happen and knowing what the potential impact is. So talking to them is a, a great place to start. So go to your risk manager if you have one. Um, they have a group, uh, uh, you know, Parma or something like that. It's a, a, a risk management association for local governments. Um, and I'm speaking at some of their events. So I'm and telling them what they need to do about cyber insurance. Uh, and I'm telling them what they need to do about cyber risk management. And I'm pointing them in your direction. So if there's, you may end up getting phone calls from your risk manager saying, hey, um, I'm supposed to talk to you about, like, how do we figure out what the risk is to this, right? Um, and so you, they'll need help to do that. Cybersecurity awareness is a big, huge thing. Again, first and last line of defense is who? Your folks. So how do we prevent them from clicking on stuff or putting in USB stick or whatever they're going to do? Uh, and NIST Special Publication 853, which is a control catalog, NIST Cybersecurity Framework, and they have a whole publication just on cybersecurity training and awareness. Training and awareness, two different things. Uh, awareness, think of Smokey the Bear. It's a training thing. It's more of a campaign to kind of raise your awareness. Um, so if you think about uh, Smokey the Bear, what's his motto? Only you can prevent poor spread. You know his buddy's name? The owl. You remember him, right? 
give a hoot, don't pollute, would be the out. Uh, there was one for cybersecurity, and if you know that one, you can write it in the audience. I want to see if anybody knows what uh, the cybersecurity, the federal government's version of Smokey the Bear for cybersecurity. Uh, he has since, he, he obviously did not make a very good income. Uh, anyway, so if you can guess what that is, let me know, and we'll give you brownie points. Uh, anyway, so one of the things you want to do is have some kind of way of alerting your staff on a regular basis of types of things. This just came out last week uh, for Scam of the Week that we get uh, um, and that we send to our clients or we do for our clients. Uh, there was a coronavirus phishing attack, uh, and they said they're going to use coronavirus as a uh, means to try and get people to click on stuff. Um, three days later, one of our employees got this message. I know it's too small to read, but it's basically saying, you know, coronavirus, I can't get out of here. Will you take $25 million and hold it for me until I get out, and I'll give you 15%, of course. Uh, nobody fell for it here, but people will. Cybersecurity Awareness Program, again, there's a whole set of controls in 853 for Cybersecurity Awareness Program, and there's a whole separate document on how to set one program up from the beginning. You, you don't have to necessarily go through all this. There's vendors that have all this stuff. Um, for some of our smaller agencies, we manage it for them because they just don't want to deal with it. IT has other problems they got to deal with. Um, so what are you going to do? You want to make sure you raise their awareness thing. Is it worth it? Well, we found that it actually does, from a cost perspective, it does uh, lower costs. Uh, it also helps uh, staff be aware of some of the new types of threats that are out there. Um, so we actually see that it's a cost-effective way. It's one of the most cost-effective ways of improving security, right? They're the first and last line of defense. So uh, we don't want to leave them defenseless. So how can we, you know, get them? It's like throwing them out on a battlefield. I always think of knights in armor, right? You throw them out on the battlefield with no armor, no <laughs> nothing, and say, okay, survive, <laughs> right? Um, so obviously we want to train them. Um, and it helps reduce their cyber stress. So when I do these presentations, I always start off with all the bad stuff, which is like, you know, the sky's falling, every freaks out. And then I end with, okay, now how can you better protect yourself here at work and at home? Because if I tell them just at work, then they don't pay attention. So I got to say at home as well. Then they're really like, oh, yeah, I want to protect my kids. I want to, you know, they're much more invested in it. Uh, and then once they understand that there's a difference between the hack that happened at Target and what happened at Equifax, they can now be less stressed out about attacks when they come in the future and say, okay, that was just credit card information, not a big deal. Oh, that was my social security number. I need to take action or I should probably monitor my credit for that. Um, so those are the types of things. What about business continuity? Uh, this is a huge one. Question I always ask is like, how long can your department last without uh, any data or any information system? I asked that for the Association of Government Accountants uh, and I asked how, them, how many of them had written procedures for what they're going to do if they had no access to stuff, and only one agency rose their hand. There's a room full of 50 people. So um, now this isn't something that you as IT people can deal with because that's how finance needs to deal with it. Parks and Recs needs to deal with it. Business license needs to deal with it. they got to deal with what they're going to do if your systems are not available, right, that you're managing. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have to have a business continuity plan. One is like, what are your recovery goals, right? Have you reviewed those? Does each other department? What is the most important thing you need to have up and running first? You know, uh, usually uh, you kind of come up with a plan that kind of goes from incident response to business continuity. And in there somewhere, the recovery process, you're going to then list out, sometimes a separate form, list out the recovery of what application, what does it have dependencies? What are those dependencies? They need to be listed out first. Um, they have to be up. You can't bring up the finance system if it's Act, Active Directory integrated until Active Directory is up and running. You can't have Active Directory up and running until you have a network up and running. Right? So you, 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 you have these cascading things that you have to make sure that everything is in line so that you can recover everything. And then you also need to know if there is any uh, types of uh, information uh, that is necessary, like licensing keys and all that kind of stuff. And you want to make sure that this plan is available offline, right? Uh, there are uh, different uh, NIST documents related to that, including the cybersecurity framework multiple times as different ways of looking at it. Uh, so it aligns with all of that. 
Um, what's interesting, ICMA back in 2016 did a survey and they found out that about, uh, for local government, only 33, a third of them had written recovery plans. Uh, and that is uh, state and local government. So I'm, I'm feeling like at that 33%, it's going to be more the counties and the states that are going to have those plans. And when you talk about the total numbers, the local governments are going to be less likely to have it. And that's not necessarily true because I'm an auditor for a lot of them. I know a lot of them have that, but I also know a lot of them don't have adequate ones. So they may have something written, but it's three or four pages long, or it hasn't been updated in five years. It needs to be updated continuously. Um, so if an application changes, there should be a change in the business recovery process, right? Or at least a review, does that need to change? If there's a new, uh, there's something new that comes into the network or, or a new application gets deployed, that's another change. So you have triggers for change and that change to then make sure there should be a process to make sure that that uh, recovery process uh, uh, is updated as well. Backup. Uh, that kind of part of what we talk about. We want to make sure you're updating everything, IT, IoT, OT, cloud, anything that can be backed up should be backed up, right? Because if you have to recover it, whether it's your ITS systems or not, uh, IoT and OT, oftentimes there, we, there is no way to back up. Sometimes there is a way to back up. If they're not backed up and they get hit, sometimes it bricks the device and it's, even if you had a backup, you couldn't recover it. So you have to take each one of those individually depending upon what the device is and if it is even capable of having some type of backup. Uh, but you also may want to have some extra uh, on-hand hardware if necessary. Uh, anyways, uh, make sure that uh, the data are packed, uh, da the backups are uh, tested, that you do them regularly, that you talk to the end user department like finance or whoever and ask them how much data do they want to have to recover. This is the conversation you have to have. Not, you want backups, yes, or not just, I'm going to back their systems up because I know they need it. I'm going to back it up once a week or every night or whatever it is. You need to talk to them and figure out what they're, what's important to them. How much time do they want to have to recover things? Uh, don't assume. Get them involved. It makes them feel better, too. But be involved. It's a shared responsibility issue. Have both people at the table and say, okay, we're setting up our backup plan. How often do you want to be backed up, right? If I back up once a week and uh, it goes out, uh, you know, we, we back up every Friday night, and you lose the server on Thursday, you're going to have a week's worth of data to put back in there. Are you okay with that? Uh, and then you also, having that discussion, because backing up once a week versus every day or multiple times a day, there's a big difference in cost. And finance may say, hey, you know, we're doing the budget, and that's really important, so I don't mind you backing it up four times a day. Um, so uh, we'll pay the extra cost for that. But that's a decision that they can make, and, and, and they can help get the money for it necessarily if it's needed. It's their business process that is being impacted, so we have to have them involved at some level. Um, making sure that it's tested. Uh, again, with the organization that uh, I talked to a couple weeks ago where they had to re-input two years' worth of financial data, they had backups. They couldn't recover them, so they didn't test the backups. Right, so making sure that they're tested on a regular basis. I know you're, you're saying, oh my gosh, we don't have the means to do all that stuff. Well, that's why you need probably more staff. Uh, do an IT uh, staffing assessment, do a risk assessment for uh, uh, the ransomware, and then you can pinpoint those other areas where you can do other assessments to kind of, uh, you know, get you the ammunition you need to get the resources you need so that the business can operate at the way that they want it to that they can achieve their mission and their goals and talking to them on their level, right? Inventory, you need to have your data all, what kind of data you have, where is it? Uh, what classification is it? Is it personally identifiable information, whatever. What applications you have running, all of them. Systems, all of them. Services, all of them. Any third parties, all of them. So all your IT, IoT, OT, and cloud. You should have an inventory of all of that and it should be up to date and it should be a living document that's constantly updated. Uh, and you need to know about each of those different types of things because when you get hit, you need to make sure that all of those devices are checked to make sure that they do not have any malware on them, including printers, including um, uh, things like projectors that are connected to the network. Uh, and these are the things that are typically not in the inventory, right? So as an auditor, I go out and somebody asks me, 
Oh, we have a complete inventory. I just walk around, look at it, and say, okay, this printer, where is it on the inventory? Oh, it's not in there. Uh, this control panel in this conference room, where is that on the inventory? Oh, it's not on the inventory. But how do you know that you've protected it if you don't even know you have it? Or it's not in your mind that you have it, right? Um, how do you know that there's, are you monitoring it for a patches and updates, right? Those types of things. And by the way, we have a conference room thing. We just had to get rid of it and get a new conference room uh, system because our old one, it wasn't even five years old. It's no longer supported. So the last backups, and we, we're not even allowed to do backups on it. We have to call the reseller to get backups done on it. Anyways, if I would have known that when we bought into it, I would have probably not bought into that. Um, nowadays, I see a lot of the um, room automation systems are just on a regular tablet. You get a regular Android tablet, you stick it up on the wall, and then you just install their app on it, and then you can at least manage the updates. Anyways, uh, lessons learned. Uh, third parties. You need to evaluate rest of all your third parties. We talked about earlier when we talked about cloud services when somebody had a question about it. Um, and then third parties is not just about clouds and other people are using. Are you monitoring them? Do you know what they're doing with your data? What part are you responsible for and what part are they responsible for? Again, this is what I like uh, about Azure and Office 365. Uh, they have a compliance manager. And in that compliance manager, if you haven't looked at it, uh, check it out. If you go to my YouTube channel, I actually did a presentation on that um, probably like three years ago. Uh, in there, it says Microsoft does this for this control in 853 for PCI, for whatever the different uh, HIPAA, whatever the different uh, standards are. And then this is what you'll, the client, the person using Office 365 is responsible for. And they do that with Azure too. So not only do they say, um, because it's not, you know, one of the controls is like manage access. Well, they have to manage access of admins to the system, and you have to manage access. So it's both of you have to do that one control, both of you at a different level. Microsoft does a really good job of delineating that out so that you know what your role is and what their role is. Um, I haven't seen anybody else do something like that. Uh, so if, if you're using another third-party cloud service, you're going to have to go in and do all that homework to find out uh, what they're doing and what you need. Uh, sometimes their, uh, their audit, if they give you their audit papers, you can kind of figure out what they're doing by reading it. Um, so they have SSA 16, and they typically delineate what their controls are and how they've implemented those controls, and you can go from there. Uh, instant response, uh, again, like your business continuity, make sure it's documented, reviewed and tested, available offline. You need to have a containment strategy for ransomware. You have different containment strategies for different things. That one, again, is going to be tied to that insurance, and if your insurance has any of those provisions in it that may limit uh, amount of coverage for that. Uh, figure out whatever external support you're going to need and what are you going to do for eradication and recovery. And then, most importantly, post-incident activities, after-action report. Um, when I was in the military, we always did an after-action report, anything we did, any training exercise. And always, we always had three questions. Well, what went right? What went wrong? What do we need to improve? Uh, and we get everybody at the table that was a part of the event, whatever it is, even if it's a test, and we ask them, what do we need to do to improve next time? This becomes, if you're familiar with Six Sigma about quality assurance and, and, and getting better quality and processes, that's all the same stuff, right? Um, I'm just telling you an easy way to do it. Military's been doing it for a long time. A lot of organizations do that. After activity, uh, after, uh, after action report, basically. Sit down, talk about it. You should do that about a lot of things, you know, implement a new software, what went right, what went wrong, and how do we improve it next time? That's just a part of quality assurance. Uh, oftentimes, this is missing because people feel um, they're too busy because they're fighting fires. Well, if you are improving the process, then maybe you would be putting out less fires, right? So um, take into consideration that, you know, sometimes getting uh, ahead in the game means that you need to uh, do that. One of the other things you need to look at before you try to recover systems, because some local governments just try to recover backups, there actually may be available um, systems uh, to decrypt the files or unlock the systems. Um, the hackers oftentimes fight with each other, and one group of hackers hacked into the other groups of hackers' things, and they took all their keys for the ransomware and released it so that anyone could encrypt their uh, software. So make sure that you check first most insurance companies will do that if they, uh, if you call them. I think in most cases, 
they called their insurance company and they were there by Monday. So uh, they're usually fairly quick to respond, usually within 48 hours. So you're going to have a little bit of downtime, but you may not be able to touch anything until they get there anyway. So, But if you can find out that you have a way of unlocking it, uh, you can save yourself some time and money. Um, also, what we found is you need to have an out-of-band way of reporting the incident. So if somebody is working on Saturday, by the way, the bad guys like to hit on Saturday nights and weekends. Why? Because typically local governments are not staffed. Or if they are staffed, it's very light staff. Now, here's what happens. Think about this. Employees sitting down at their computer, it's Saturday, uh, and they notice something's not working right. And they try to call you, and now the phone doesn't work. And now their computer doesn't work, and they can't get to email. How are they going to report it? And then, yes, there's a whole other question about uh, we don't have staff monitoring things on Saturday. Well, and maybe you do. A lot of smaller uh, cities don't have, you know, uh, you know, uh, a thing where you have staff available on site uh, to manage things on Saturday. But you still want to be able to out of band because if they take out your phone system and your email system, how are people going to report it? And this could, in, uh, as far as containment goes, this could be vitally important. That as soon as there's an indication that there's a problem, you have a way of uh, containing it so it does not spread everywhere. Again, decrease the impact as much as possible. So how are you going to do that? you got to think that through. Uh, maybe that means that you have to give your cell phone number out or the city needs to get a cell phone number for uh, whoever's going to be on call. Um, and if you don't have somebody who's going to be on call on the weekends, maybe you need to invent that, right? So a part of this whole incident uh, response is a part of this as well. Uh, and it's something that uh, local governments are going to have to look at uh, in order to uh, uh, have a containment strategy and kind of reduce the impact. Now, one of the questions that's asked on the forum, so I, I'll explain it a little bit, is do you have advanced threat protection for your email security? Um, so what are some of the things that that means, right? Um, and I broke them out in separate questions, um, but uh, you want to test all the attachments. Like you have a, uh, there's a lot of spam filtering software out there that doesn't offer cybersecurity stuff. You have to pay extra for the cybersecurity stuff. And sometimes it's all a cart and sometimes they do this or that, or they don't do the other thing. Some of the things you want it to do is test all the attachments. Open up that attachment in a virtual machine that's not on your network. Now, the bad guys figured that out that they're doing it, and so they put time bombs in it so that when you open up an attachment, it doesn't strike immediately, it strikes later. It's like a time delay. Because what ends up happening with most of these is as the email goes through the email server, they open it up in a virtual machine to see if there's any change to that virtual machine. If there isn't any, then that uh, service will then deliver the email to your account or to your system that then puts it in the inbox. Well. Uh, they figured that out, so they have a time delay on that. So these are not, these are like a minimum thing, but it's not like a silver bullet is going to solve all your problems. Uh, spoofing prevention, so that if somebody says they're the, they use an email address that says city manager's name in it with some other <coughs> uh, organization or, you know, Comcast or at t or whatever domain name, Gmail, Hotmail, whatever, that it sees that the name is the same as somebody else in your organization and then flags it so that the recipient gets it and says, whoa, this says it's from our CEO, city manager, general manager, but it says it's from outside the organization. Then the person can then call the person and say, hey, did you send me something from your Gmail account? Um, this is also a good reason why you should have a policy that any city business is only conducted on email system provided by the city. Um, anyways, to, it helps prevent this. Uh, anyways, another thing is what about uh, putting warning banners on external sources? I think a year and a half ago or two years ago, we had actually sent out a thing because uh, finance was getting hit pretty hard with these types of uh, uh, spoofed, uh, spoofed emails. And so um, we actually had a lot of local governments actually start putting the warning banners on their uh, systems. Um, the spoofing prevention can sort of help with that, but if it's not the same name as somebody in your Active Directory, then it comes through, um, you know, they, they may use another name. They may pretend to be somebody outside the organization that actually does business with the city. So uh, the warning banner can kind of help remind people uh, to do this. That's like a security awareness type of control. 
Um, of course, regular training on that would uh, help as well. Network security. All right, so we can talk all day about network security. Um, they are recommending getting close as possible, in our recommendation, to a zero trust network. Uh, one, block all known malicious IP addresses and block all known malicious DNS uh, requests. A lot of firewalls do it. There's, uh, I, we don't resell Cisco or anything, but I know that they have the umbrella product that does it. VeriSign used to have a DNS firewall, which they sold to somebody else. Uh, anyways, there's all these other uh, organizations that can do that kind of stuff. Some firewalls may have that in their functionality. You have to check on what you have. Uh, to keep up to date with known bad lists. Now, the bad guys know that, and they're constantly changing the IP address they're coming from, and they're constantly changing DNS. One of the bad guys that they caught, uh, I think it was the Belarusian, he had like 53,000 uh, different domain names that he had control over that he would move his malicious uh, code around for his bot network so that it was really hard to pinpoint uh, where it was. You want to be able to filter all that stuff out. And again, not a silver bullet, but it is a uh, thing. Restricting internet access. If you have an IoT device that's on your network and it does not need to get to the internet, your firewall should block outbound from those devices. Now, there has always been this kind of thing since I've been in this industry for 25 years. When we first started out, we barely had firewalls, right? And when we started having firewalls, we made it really hard to get in, but everything was allowed out. That days of letting everything out is over, right? You need to restrict what gets out of your network. In fact, uh, the way we have it set up for like DNS protocol cannot leave our network. It can only go to our one server for DNS, and that DNS only goes out to one specific third-party DNS server that's filtering for all the bad DNS. So there is nothing inside of my network that can resolve any DNS name unless it goes to a known good source. Uh, firewall blocks all outbound for it, right? That's getting closer to a zero trust network. That is not the complete zero trust network, but um, that's part of what you gotta do. Yes, network segmentation is a part of this, but you all know that the Department of Justice, the CJIS requires that you have the police department on separate segmented network behind another firewall, and yet they're still getting hit with ransomware, right? So network segmentation is not enough, right? So we gotta go further than that. Um, part of that is also if, the finance folks need to have access to the finance share for a server. Nobody else needs to have access to that share. Then we should actually block that on the local host, uh, local host firewall. Now we're moving closer to zero trust network, right? We need to control within the network what everybody is connecting to. And if they don't have a reason to connect to it, we should not allow it. What does this do for us practically? I know it's a pain in the ass because it's a lot of work to do, but what does that do for us practically? It makes it very difficult that once a hacker gets into your network for them to move around, right? It gets it to the point where they may just give up, hopefully cross their fingers, right? Um, that's what we're trying to do, trying to limit their movement once in. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, so zero trust networks can kind of help with that. It may also help contain it. It may make it so that they can only launch an attack on part of it uh, instead of the entire network, right? So the more you do that. Vulnerability management. So we'll talk about doing regular scans, doing patch management, doing configuration management, all this kind of stuff that you should be doing, making sure that you're including everything, IT, IoT, OT, cloud, firmware. It's not, I didn't list firmware there, sorry. Firmware needs to be done as well. Pen test versus regular vulnerability scan, the two different things, have two different goals with it don't have time to talk about it now, but we'll do a, a, a presentation in the future that kind of talks about the differences between the two and when you would want to use one over the other. Um, and how you can kind of get what you would get out of pen test out of a, a scan, or actually you can probably get better results out of a scan. Uh, pen test kind of gives you a little bit, there's two things you're testing. One is that it can actually happen. Uh, and then two, uh, if you do it uh, blindfolded, in other words, your staff doesn't know that the pen test happens, you can also test your incident response capabilities. Um, but other than that, uh, uh, an authenticated vulnerability scan gives you typically more information than a pen test. A pen test. However, a city manager having something on his desktop saying we own you uh, from a pen test uh, could uh, get you more funding. So you've got to kind of just weigh that out. Uh, 
vulnerability management. Um, so what I find, so I go in here and I do scans all the time. What I'm finding, here's, so here's what I have an assessment of local governments. Again, I primarily only do local governments, so I don't do corporations. I don't do um, a lot of nonprofits. We do have a few nonprofits. Um, most of those are kind of related to the local government. But what we have found in most of the, most of the time is they're really good at patching window systems. Most of the time, the patches and windows are within 60 to 90 days of being patched. Uh, there's always a few stragglers um, that still haven't been patched. So the patch management process isn't, you know, 100%. Um, but, you know, I don't see a lot of Windows vulnerabilities. But what do we find? Their network is complete with keys. Why? Because they're not very good at um, doing Linux devices, and they're not very good at IT, IO, the IoT devices, uh, the other operating systems, and like uh, network devices, switches, routers, access points, uh, the, the, all those other IoT devices, OT devices. What we find almost every time we do scans is we find that there, that's where the, the hole is. That's where the missing part is. Now, I think part of that is Windows, uh, Microsoft gives you uh, products to make sure that all of you are free so that you can actually make sure that your systems are up to date. And Windows 10 kind of forces the issue. Um, but so we can kind of see that uh, the Windows stuff is getting secure, and we've relied upon those tools. And there's technically, there's not a lot of tools out there that's actually going to cover everything. There's a lot of people out there that will tell you, hey, we can do patch management. We can cover everything. Well, let's find out they can cover everything. Are they covering that uh, device that you have in the conference room? Are, are they covering your phone system and the phone handsets? Are they covering your uh, security cameras or the, your door systems? Are they covering all of those things as well? Um, so uh, one of the things that um, uh, you want to make sure is you got to figure out what devices you have, part of that inventory thing that I already talked about. And then the next thing is making sure that uh, you have a process to monitor for patches and make sure patches get applied to them. Uh, and maybe you just calendar it in. You know, every six months we're going to go in and check, you know, to see if uh, there's any updates on this system and then this system. or if you have like 20 different systems that you have to deal with, cameras, uh, 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 door, door security systems, whatever it is, you can actually calendarize that out and then have your staff once a month, they're gonna look up one thing to see if there is any uh, updates for those things. If there are, uh, deal with it. Uh, it's really kind of important to calendarize some of those work functions so that you make sure you're not missing any of those things, right? Uh, so that's part of it. I do have a question. Can you recommend applications to perform these scans and pen tests? Yes, I will in a minute. Um, let me get to a, another part first. Vulnerability management, thanks for the question, by the way, you're, you're reading my mind. Vulnerability management is not just patch management, which most people think, or vulnerability scanning. Uh, it's also configuration management. A lot of people will either think that patch management, they're patching their window system and so they, they're dealing with vulnerabilities, but that's missing applications, that's missing firmware, that's missing uh, all those IoT devices and other things. Um, if they're only doing patch management. If they're only doing vulnerability scanning, um, you're missing out on um, typically what I find when people are just doing vulnerability scanning is they run a vulnerability scan, they get a report, says all the bad things, they go and fix it, uh, and then they run it next month and they have the same problem. You should Vulnerability scans should inform your patch management process to improve your patch management process until you're running vulnerability scans and you're not getting any problems. Uh, configuration management is all the other vulnerabilities not related to a missing patch or a vulnerability in systems, such as using uh, obsolete, obsolete um, what do you call it, uh, protocols and stuff like that, or you've configured a system to be too open or too uh, uh, not restricting it. Uh, so those three things are a part of it. Part of it is also getting rid of anything that's obsolete, obsolete protocols, obsolete and outdated software. If you have Windows 7, it should be top priority to get out of there. But you probably have other applications, um, line of business applications, possibly like a finance server or something like that, that you can't upgrade. Well, they need to look at that because if it's no longer supported, it's obsolete up to date, it is a higher risk. If it's a higher risk, maybe you can figure out a way to protect it. For example, getting rid of SMB version 1, you may have an application that relies upon SMB version 1. If you try to upgrade it to the more secure one, it won't work. Well, that doesn't mean don't upgrade SMB version 1 update SMD version, turn it off, basically what you need to do, on everything else, and then only allow that one share for that one legacy application, and then put some extra controls around it, right? So set the firewall up to allow SMD version one traffic only from this other 
application, right? Get back to that zero trust idea that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so get rid of it wherever you can. And if you do have anything that's outdated, you're going to have a lot more work to do to kind of lock it down. But you need to lock it down. Because SMB version one is one of the ways that ransomware is spreading. Uh, patch management, centralize it. Do it within 30 days. I know that's onerous, but that's what you got to do. Catch everything, including firmware. Um, what are kind of applications out there? Um, we kind of do it. So I'm not trying to sell anything, but uh, uh, there's all kinds of applications out there. And rather than me sell anything or say anything or giving really uh, anything out there, uh, you can go to Gartner and they have the magic quadrant. You can look at who the best vulnerability scanners are uh, and pen testers as well to get applications or services from other clients that do that. Um, uh, configuration management, setting up a process. NIST has all kinds of guidelines on it. You want to have a known good configuration that you have tested that you know is secure and locked down, and then you should roll that out, and then you should make sure that you update that as new applications change that. You need to monitor that to make sure it doesn't change, and if it does change, find out why it changed, figure out what the root cause is, make sure it doesn't happen again. I know that's a lot of work, um, but that's the configuration and change management process, uh, and NIST has a lot of guidance on it. Um, about locking down systems to known good configurations. And that's what you want to have. Uh, and this is going to be vital um, uh, to making sure that you can contain or potentially avoid getting hit. Because if it's a misconfiguration that lets people in, um, you want to do it. Uh, Anti-malware. Obviously, uh, antivirus, anti-malware is something you need to have. Make sure it's running real time. You're doing automatic scans regularly. And some of them actually have ransomware prevention turns off, it's a configuration that you have to turn on. Um, so you might want to turn that on. You might want to check to make sure and see if your anti-malware has that capability. And again, it's not going to be 100% uh, effective in all cases. Um, but it's, it's better than nothing, right? And almost every organization that has been hit with ransomware has had the latest edition of the antivirus or anti-malware running on the system when it got hit. So again, it's not enough, but if you don't have it, um, it's just going to be easier for the bad guys to do it. Access control, kind of talked about it. You may want to consider multi-factor authentication. Um, you want to limit privileged accounts. I know that's very difficult. I talk to IT people about that all the time. Least access for everything, applications, everything. People, accounts, any kind of account, least access, least access, least privilege. I mean, we've been talking about this for years, but this is the time we really need to implement that. Application whitelisting. Again, none of these are silver bullets, but if you have them in place, it reduces the risk. Um, so you want to look at those things wherever you can. Remote desktop protocol, even inside of your network. Once inside your network, they can exploit the remote desktop protocol, even if you don't use it outside your network. And by the way, when Microsoft has a patch about it, it says it's really important, it should be patched. Um, we recently did, like within the last weeks or so, just did uh, vulnerability scans on networks for local governments, and guess what? We still saw this unpatched. It's been out since last summer, end of last summer, August, September, somewhere in there. They came up with a patch for this problem. There's a patch available, and it's still not patched. This is a big, big one, because this SMB and remote desktop protocol are one of the protocols that they're using the vulnerabilities for to get into the system. Uh, you can use alternatives. If you're going to use the remote desktop protocol, use a VPN for it, whitelist connections, um, other types of things you can do. Maybe not have it external. Uh, those are some of the things that you can work on. So, again, part of the thing is make sure that you're not going to make yourself an easy mark for the bad guys once they get in. So implement as many of these controls as you possibly can. I understand you can't do all of these tomorrow, uh, but you need to kind of work forward on it. you got to start somewhere. Uh, so what to do next? Same thing I already told you about. Get the questionnaire, run internal scans, figure out what your risk level is, do a gap analysis, uh, and then come out with that uh, list of things that you need to do and then create a report and give it to management so that they understand what is necessary uh, to protect them. Now, I'm going to end on this, and that is that there's a lot of standards out there and a lot of people talk about it. cybersecurity framework is objectives. It's not actual controls. So it's kind of like high-level statements, not specific do X, Y, and Z. It refers you back to NIST 853 as a control catalog. The risk management framework, which I talked about earlier, also points you back to that catalog. The OT guidelines for NIST also point to that as a catalog. ISA's OT requirements 
linked to 853 as a control catalog. ISO 2701 does to that. The AWWA voluntary um, uh, guidance that they have for water districts for controls for industrial control systems aligns with the NIST cybersecurity framework, which also then uh, aligns with 853. And COBIT, uh, the governance framework, also aligns with 853. So guess what I'm going to tell you to start, right? So you can do all these things that I just listed out here, but all of those things you've noticed on the right-hand side, all of them had a NIST equivalent or a NIST cybersecurity equivalent to them. So if you were doing 853, you're already way better off than if you weren't, right? So it's my pitch for, you know, selling the NIST governance. But if you look at the cybersecurity framework, they want you to identify, protect, detect, recover, and respond. That's basically the same type of stuff we just talked about here uh, when it comes to ransomware. So making sure that we're in all these areas, and again, each one of these areas has an objective, and then it points you to 853 for the specifics. And again, 853 is a control catalog. You don't, and I can't get into all of 853 because we're running out of time, but um, that can be a future conversation about uh, security standards and how they work together. The nice thing about the cybersecurity framework is it actually kind of can take, uh, if you look at the NIST cybersecurity framework, the objective, IDAM-1, physical devices and systems within organization are inventory. Remember I was telling you about inventory? So CIS typically controls number one is to do that inventory. COVID covers it um, at the governance level. Uh, ISA, which is the OT, Operational Technology or Industrial Control System, their standards cover it. And NIST and ISO on the IT level also cover it. So there's an alignment. If you use the cybersecurity framework and 853, you can actually align everything for the general high level governance, OT and IT. Uh, can all kind of be under one umbrella. Uh, so uh, following it and making sure that you have a governance in place can really help you out. If you have any other questions uh, as I finish up here, please uh, post them. Um, we do like feedback, so please give me some feedback. Um, uh, let us know how it was and know that we have another session coming up. Uh, Bright Talks channel, if you uh, go into your uh, profile, you can actually see how long you watch this. So uh, you can use this for continuing education. Uh, as you've noticed, there's, it's not a sales presentation. This is all just education. Um, so there's, uh, you would want to do this as education. Depending, like if you're a CISSP, they'll ask you, uh, is, is this a sales presentation? Because they assume that half of it is sales pitch and the other half is the, the education part of it. But all this was education. So uh, you can use all of that as your um, uh, reporting, and you can use that make a PDF, or it's, it's, it's recorded there, so you can always go back and check it out. If you have any questions, let us know. Um, just one note on uh, Mason Associates, we do all kinds of cybersecurity services. Uh, we've been doing it for a long time. We're partners with all kinds of things, and that's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, if you want more information, my blog is at learnsecurity.org. Please rate this session, let us know, give us feedback. Uh, and obviously, the sound is feedback we already got, and we already, Took care of that at this session and future session. I think I'm just trying to use my cell phone and avoid using the other. Um, any other questions? Well, go out there and make the world cyber safe. All right. Take care.